I'm almost ready to test drive my crashed 2017 Volkswagen Golf R. The only thing that's really holding me back is the back. I still have a blown out windshield, a busted in tailgate, broken taillights, and the bumper is just barely hanging on. Now luckily most of the stuff can be replaced pretty quickly because I managed to pick up a near identical tailgate with a complete windshield. Not only that, but I even have a bumper which I showed you guys in the last video. The problem is the rear bumper doesn't have parking sensors and my current one on the car does, so we need to figure out how to transfer this to the new one. I also discovered some more problems with my wiring harness because after I scanned the car in last week's episode, I managed to have more codes than where I started from. And I think it has something to do with me shocking myself from playing with this without turning off the battery. All right. Yep, that was me last week shocking myself on exposed rear wires, reminding me yet again to always unplug the battery when working on anything electrical in your car. Fortunately though, the shock didn't prevent me from continuing to fix the rear end of the Volkswagen. I powered through my injuries, no matter how small, and managed to completely rewire and fix the severed wiring harness. You see, in the last episode, I was able to finish the rest of the interior, which involved installing the last of the airbags, clearing majority of the fault codes and lights on the instrument cluster and even fixing the instrument cluster itself. Something that had given me a near heart attack when I first started working on the Volkswagen. Turned out to be as simple as turning the dial counterclockwise back into its correct position, bringing me that much closer to getting this car back on the road. So before I start working on the rear end of the car, I just want to figure out what new codes I've now developed from messing around with the rear end of the wiring harness and figure out if I can start it and hopefully it's an easy fix. And with that, I have this OBD11 device which helps me scan the car and figure out what codes I actually set and also being able to clear them. All right, so after re-scanning the car, you can see we now have 30 fault codes instead of last week's episode where we only had about 26. So somehow I've created more faults than when I started. As it appears, these are the actual fault codes that I'm starting to get, which I've never had before. I now have faults for the heater support pump, as well as bank one and bank one camshaft adjustment. So after giving the wiring harness a quick once over to confirm nothing was left exposed, I decided to move on to the next best thing, which was checking the fuse box for any blown fuses, as it's usually the culprit in situations like this, and here's why. You see, cars today have a lot of electrical components to them, and car fuses are designed to protect them. When an overcurrent or short circuit occurs, which is what I'm pretty sure I did, the fuse, which is typically a metal wire strip, will melt when too strong a current passes through it, thus stopping the flow of electricity and breaking the circuit to a given device as a way of protecting it. Now, with a little help from my girlfriend's dad, Doug, we were able to test all the fuses in the engine bay using a fuse tester. Connecting the end of the fuse tester to ground and touching the top prongs on the fuses with the pointy end, the tester will light up blue with the voltage to indicate that power is running through it properly. One thing to keep in mind, though, is using this method will only show you what's getting power when power is running through it. What this means is if the car is off, not only could I find a broken fuse, but I will also find all the good fuses that just aren't getting power. As you can see, when I put the car in accessory mode, now all those fuses are working and getting power. Luckily, Doug showed me another method using a voltmeter, which I like a lot better. Setting the meter to 200 ohms tests for continuity, and the results are pretty much straightforward. If the multimeter goes to zero or close to it, then there is continuity between the multimeter leads, meaning the fuse is good. If the multimeter shows a one or higher, then there is too much resistance within the fuse and the fuse is blown and needs to be replaced. Using this method, we were actually able to find a fuse that was blown. So that's the one that's blown. The fuse that I pulled is fuse number seven. And as you can see by this diagram, number seven controls the solenoid valve and also the heater support pump, which explains why I was getting those random codes. I disconnected the battery and used a little fuse grabber to pull out the fuse and replace it with a new one. All right, so check this out. I pretty much figured out the problem. As you can see, this is definitely something that you can't just leave like this. Right in between, you can see where there's supposed to be metal 
There's nothing, which means this fuse was blown and probably tripped when I shocked myself. So it appeared the fuse solved the problem. As you can see, we no longer have those weird camshaft and heater core shorts in the uh, computer anymore, which is super cool. And it appears that we might have solved the problem. So now I guess it's time to start working on the rear of the car. All right, so the next step is taking off this rear bumper, which is pretty much already halfway complete. Granted, it already comes off. All the clips on this side were broken and the wiring harness is pretty much already unplugged. So I just have to take a few screws off on the other side of the car. And then this bumper should really just like pop off. Lucky for me, removing the rear bumper was pretty straightforward, especially since I only have one side now to work on. Most of the screws are in plain sight except for one, which was a pain in the butt to remove. I tried using a regular ratchet, then an electric ratchet, and finally I used an electric ratchet with a wobble extension, a long one, and after about 10 attempts laying on the floor with my light, I was able to finally get it off. Now obviously taking the wheel off would have made this a lot easier, but I was lazy and I did not want to move the car. All right guys, so good news, the bumper came off real nice and easy, but I wanna show you what we're working with. So this is obviously the damaged bumper, but this has parking sensors. Notice here, this big cable and all these sensors that are attached to the rear end of this bumper. This is totally cool. The problem is on our donor bumper here, it doesn't have it. All it has is the wiring harness for the lights right here, your, uh, what is this? Your license plate lights here. So what we have to do is transfer all these parking sensors and everything that's on this rear bumper over to that. Now, the good thing is I was trying to figure out where do we mount these because obviously there's no holes on this bumper, but I noticed here that Volkswagen has actually marked out where the holes go and where the actual brackets go that hold the bumper, that hold the parking sensors. So that's really cool and should make this process a lot easier. The first thing that has to get removed is the parking sensors so that it can access the bracket underneath it. Once unplugged, you can push the two clips away and the sensor will simply pop out of its holder. I did this to all the sensors and clips and removed the harness from the bumper. Now, since I need to make holes in the new bumper, I used a step bit to measure the size of the hole and marked it with tape so that I don't go past it. All right, so with the wiring harness officially off the bumper, the next step is gonna be taking these clips off, which are unfortunately plastic welded into the bumper, which means we're gonna have to plastic weld them off the bumper and transfer them onto the donor one. Well, after messing around with the plastic welder for a little, I realized that it was making a bigger mess and not going as smoothly as I wanted. So I decided to try drilling out the factory plastic welds with the idea that it would come off a lot cleaner and hopefully a lot quicker. Luckily, that's exactly what happened. Once the holes were all drilled, I could pry it off with a screwdriver. My friend Sean was also able to help me do the rest of the bracket. Once they were all off the original bumper, I could start prepping the donor bumper for the transplant. I removed the donor wiring harness, which only has plugs for the license plate lights and set it to the side. I took my step bit and carefully drilled the first hole, making sure not to go too deep as there's no going back. I also checked to make sure that the sensor fit and it was perfect. I drilled the rest of the holes and the hard part was actually over. All right, I need you to feel this one too. Wow. Perfect, right? Soft? It's a tad rough. I just gotta put tad rough, yeah. Because I didn't get the, the little edges off. It's a little loose. Baby's bottom. After making sure the wiring harness aligned properly, it was time to plastic weld the brackets to the donor bumper. Sean was able to hold the sensors flush with the bumper so that I could plastic weld the brackets correctly. I also used a fan to blow the smoke away as I'm sure nothing good comes from breathing in this junk. With 
the last bracket welded on, it was time to finally attach the wiring harness for good. Look at that. Uh, an hour later and we officially have a bumper with parking sensors in the perfect spots with the perfect size hole. Bumper just needs to get painted, but doesn't mean it's not gonna work. Sick. So guys, the surgery went well. We were able to transfer the wiring harness from the old bumper with parking sensors to the new donor bumper that doesn't have parking sensors. Everything's drilled in, everything's lining up perfectly. I just wanna show you what it looks like super quick. Just loosely put it on the car just for storage sakes. But you guys can see the parking sensors are perfectly aligned, smooth, and exactly where they're supposed to be. You would never know that this was without parking sensors. Now to wrap up today's video, the last thing that we have to do is going to be swapping out this rear tailgate with the donor one that we have right here. Honestly, I don't think it's gonna be all that difficult. The only problem that I could potentially see having is because those are on used parts. So those are used parts, not new. When plugging that into the car, there's a chance that like the backup camera and maybe some of the lights might register with the car as not from the same VIN and it might not let us use it, which means then we're gonna have to transfer the old stuff off this tailgate onto the new one over here. Now, in order to transfer the tailgate, I need to prep the one that I bought because the wires are cut off at the top. This is not really a big deal as I won't be using them anyway, but as you can see, most of the wires are pretty easy to access from just the front of the tailgate. To start, there are two wires that can be unplugged by removing the black clip first and then by pulling the red clip and pinching in and pulling out. And I did this to both of them. The next piece I removed is a bit tricky. It's the rear windshield washer hose and it has the same clip on it like the ones I removed in a previous video on the hood of the car. Next up was removing the ground wire which is held in place with a screw. I put the screw back on also just so I wouldn't misplace it. Now I'm not sure what these white and tan plugs are for but those can easily be unplugged too. Once unplugged, I used my fancy clip removal tool that I got in a kit when I was removing the dash trim. And if you want the kit, I'll put a link to this in the description below. With everything unplugged that was easily accessible, I was left with only two wires still connected. One is for the third brake light and the other, I believe, runs down to the backup camera. I figured I'd tackle the backup camera wire now and leave the brake light wire for later when it's mounted to the car. Now, unfortunately, in order to access the backup camera connector, all the trim pieces have to come off. The biggest one is held down by four T12 screws that I was able to remove, and then I could move on to removing the top two trim pieces first by carefully yanking them as they're just held on by clips. Once those are out of the way, I could then remove the big piece by giving it a nice tug, and off it came. With that out of the way, I could clearly see where I could disconnect the backup camera and remove the wire, which is held down by insulated tape. I just cut the tape with a razor blade in order to free the wire up. And with the new tailgate ready to be swapped, it was finally time to start disassembling the old one on the car. Everything I literally just did to the new one now has to be done to the old one in order for it to come off. This is because I can't just cut the wires since I'm gonna be keeping them for the new one. With everything disassembled, the last thing that needs to come off is the dreaded third brake light wire. I was debating about cutting this and splicing it into the new one, but I decided it would be better to just keep it OEM. 
Now, in order to remove this, three nuts have to come off from the inside, and then using some trim removal tools, I could peel the trunk spoiler off from the adhesive that's holding it on. It's as simple as unplugging it, and we're free. Now that this is off, you can also see that windshield fluid hose I was talking about earlier. With everything unplugged, it was finally time to remove this old tailgate from the car. With a little help from Heather, I was able to pull the two hydraulic arms off. There's a little metal clip that you have to remove first, and then it just pops off. And then the only thing left holding this to the car is just four 10 millimeter nuts. So guys, before I forget, I wanna do another build cost update. So far, we've added the rear bumper to the back and we're installing the tailgate. I was able to get each of them for 300 a piece, which brings our grand total to $18,933, which isn't too bad so far. We really don't have much left in this build. With the old tailgate off, it's finally time to install the new one. I think Heather and I tried about three or four times before we were able to line it up and put the screws on. But with it finally in place, it was now time to put it all back together. <laughs> Remember that last wire I had to remove from the new tailgate? Well, now's the time I'm taking it off. I used a trim tool and fishing line to separate the glue from the spoiler. This way it will free itself from the tailgate. Then I could unplug everything and remove the last bit of cut wire out from the tailgate. I routed the new wire through the top of the tailgate and reattached it back to the spoiler. Then I could tighten down those three 10 millimeter bolts I was telling you about earlier. And finally, I could put it all back together. Alright guys, that is it for today's video. We officially got the tailgate back on the car and it aligns pretty freaking good if I do say so myself. I don't think there's going to be any more moving, but before we wrap up the episode, I want to test out and make sure that the taillights work because the old one didn't work and that the backup camera works because I really don't want any more coding that needs to be done to the VIN. So let me go hop in the car and see if these taillights and the backup camera work correctly. All right, well, I was able to get the uh, rear backup camera working. I can't believe it. Uh, it's th literally that simple. All right, guys, I can't believe it. You know, the day's the day where this thing got installed. You can see everything lines up really, really, really nice here. Obviously, we can't close it just yet because we got to work on this tail light here, which is stopping it from fully closing. But everything looks good. Now, unfortunately, I ordered this thing blue so I wouldn't have to repaint it and it was shipped with YRC Freight, and they changed up and moved around my stuff and managed to damage the back of this here and here, which is super annoying. I even think they scratched the glass right here. So I have a claim in with YRC Freight, the shipping company, to hopefully get me reimbursed because this is gonna cost like 700 bucks to get the back of this repainted. But otherwise, I'm so stoked it's finally on. And honestly, from the back, it doesn't look too shabby. So with that being said, that is a wrap for today's video. If you're liking this content, then definitely make sure to smash the like button, turn on post notifications, subscribe, and I will see you in tomorrow's video. Peace.
able to find the manual, which helped me find the correct fuse instead of blah, 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 blah. Dude, you are sounding like a chump. Pull me closer.